Welcome back from lunch, everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, before we get uh, back into it, uh, just a quick reminder, if everybody could please go take the survey when we're done, uh, try and get as much feedback as we can so we can try and make improvements and make these training sessions as uh, useful for you as possible. So any feedback you've got, please go take the survey and let us know. All right. Um, Let's get into what is the usage of MPI and co-arrays co in those real-world examples. Uh, what does that look like? <clears throat> All right, so let's start with the Mandelbrot area example again. Um, just a quick refresher uh, for the serial example. We've got um, a program that's going to calculate the area of the Mandelbrot set via sampling of points in a grid and then the area inside of the Mandelbrot set is a ratio of the areas in the Mandelbrot set to those outside given this uh, rectangular area. Um, so, so we can just kind of do a sampling and, and determine the area of the Mandelbrot set. Um, it involves a couple of loops, uh, one from one to the number of points and second one to half the number of points. So we're kind of getting this rectangular area that we're going to sample from. Uh, so what does we, we yesterday we took a look at what does this look like uh, in terms of the use of do concurrent or open MP. So what does this look like when we're trying to distribute this work across uh, multiple machines? So a distributed memory programming model. Uh, so let's start with what does this look like for MPI? Uh, so for MPI, we're going to have that use MPI F08. Um, then of course we got to call MPI init. Uh, we'll figure out how many processes do we have and what what process am I um, and we'll have this intermediate variable a uh, partial area and uh, for the work distribution we're just going to use the same trick that we used for the matrix multiplication where we're just going to go uh, 1 2 n but counting by number of processes. So each, uh, so each rank is going to do a subset of those iterations where it's just one. So assuming we go n equals four and we've got two processes, rank zero is going to do one and three and rank one is going to do two and four, right? So we're just doing that uh, with that that simpler way of uh, distributing the uh, the problem, um, but the rest, uh, for the most part, the rest of the code is going to look uh, nearly identical. Um, uh, we haven't really changed the loop structure at all. We haven't really changed the calculations that are going to be done. Uh, we haven't changed this uh, Julia function that uh, determines whether the, the point is inside of the area or not. Um, but then when we're all done, we're going to use an MPI reduce. Um, we really only need the answer on one process, so we're just going to do the regular MPI reduce uh, and store the answer in the area variable. So again, um, we, need, we need the intermediate variable to uh, let the MPI reduce uh, function uh, work correctly. Uh, and then we're just going to get the answer on rank zero. Uh, I know without uh, without having the, the, the interface written right in front of you, it's a little bit harder to spot, but that, that's the one, that's the argument that specifies which rank do we want the answer on. Um, and then once we're all done, we'll say uh, uh, if on rank zero, we do the final calculation to uh, get the ratio to calculate the right area and then see what our answer is. So uh, again, uh, doesn't really require any extra command line arguments for the compiler to compile the example. So we'll compile that example and then s run to run it. 
Uh, just real quick refresher for those who can see it. Uh, the Mandelbrot area example looks looks about the same as it did before, but we've got to use MPI. We've got calls to see calls to the MPI procedures before we get started on the calculations using an intermediate variable instead uh, so that the MPI reduce works and using the the increment to do the decomposition between ranks. Uh, and then so we're able to run that example and uh, get the right answer or at least close to it. So are there any questions on the Mandelbrot example for MPI? So I'll double check the question here. Um, okay, um, if not, we'll go ahead and let's take a quick look at what does this example look like for co-arrays. So with co-arrays, we don't need the extra use statement for MPI. Um, we don't need the extra intermediate variable for the area. Um, we're still going to determine how many processors, how many processes and uh, oh, uh, how many processes do we have and which one am I? Uh, set the area equal to zero to start with. We're going to use the same trick for the problem decomposition. Uh, it's just that uh, images are numbered starting at one, so we don't need the plus one there. Uh, but the, the rest of the loops look identical. And then instead of an MPI reduce, we can just use a cosum and we only need the image on, or we only need the answer on image one. So we can specify that as one of the optional arguments to cosum. And then do the final adjustment of the area calculation and then show it on image one. And again, we don't need any special compiler flags. We can just compile it. Oh, you know what? I had forgotten to use the Cray compiler. So let's do the MPI example again, just to make sure that it is still working with the Cray compiler. Let's run an MPI. Yes, it appears to still be working. All right. So FTN co-arrays. Well, let's compile the co-array example. And then S run the co-array example. We'll see if this one will run with all eight processes. Nope, it does not seem to want to be able to do that for some reason. Let's try it with seven. And we get the right answer. Basically identical to the MPI version. Okay, so any questions on the Mandelbrot example on how we were able to do the problem decomposition for that? All right then, those are going a little faster than yesterday. The uh, next one is a bit more complicated though, so let's start taking a look at the burger solver. So reminder again, um, so this is uh, doing a solution of the burger's equation uh, for diffusion and or uh, uh, heat transfer. Um, just a 1D uh, where the domain is uh, 2 pi, and we're going to initialize it with a sinusoidal, uh, just 10 times sine, uh, and the derivative calculations are assuming a, uh, a periodic boundary condition. So the derivative is going to look at um, the the right hand side, the derivative at the left hand side is going to look at the right hand side and vice versa. 
um, but uh, we'll we'll do a, a time stepping uh, to do the solution of the Burgers equation. So what does this start to look like if we want to use MPI? So for MPI, we're of course going to use the MPI module. Um, we're going to set time equal to zero. Every every rank is going to do this, so it's it is okay to do some things before you call MPI init. Um, and in this example, what we can do to prevent having to really kind of modify our main program so much and then start to, um, kind of, I, I don't know, feel, you know, adjust this so that all of the MPI stuff starts to clutter up and, and obfuscate the, uh, the, the high level algorithm that we're trying to implement. Um, we can actually kind of hide the MPI init stuff down in our uh, init function or our init subroutine that we already had. Um, we're just going to add the, the additional out arguments for uh, determining how many processes are there and which one am I. Um, but the, the, initial, the initialization is still going to look the same um, with a slight modification. Um, we are actually going to enforce that our number of points is uh, d evenly divisible by the number of processors that we've got. Um, this just simplifies us having to deal with um, kind of adjusting for the uneven distribution of points in across uh, doing the domain decomposition. So we're, we're going to go ahead and enforce that that's just evenly divisible. Like I said, this is not really a best practice. You want to try and you know, code in such a way that you allow for any number of processes, including just one. But uh, in, in this instance, just to make the the example easier, we'll, we'll go ahead and enforce that. Um, and then this is where we're going to start doing the domain decomposition now. Uh, so instead of the, uh, the field that we're going to be, you know, trying to solve over and do the time stepping over, um, each rank is just going to have a subset of the number of points across that whole global field. So we're only going to act, we're only going to allocate uh, the number of points that uh, on this rank, we're only going to allocate the number of points that it's going to be working on. And then, and, and then go ahead and initialize it with that, that function uh, where here we're uh, calculating the the x coordinate for the points of this rank. We're adjusting the the x coordinates so that we're uh, making sure we're getting in the right position. And so that's that's the adjustment to the initialization. Is now each rank is going to have a a different part of this global field. So we've kind of manually distributed the initial state across the different processes. Then for our derivative calculations, what we're going to do is we're going to need to determine for the boundary conditions and doing the uh, derivative calculations, we need the neighboring points. So on the left hand, right hand side of the domain that this rank is working on, we need to get the data from our neighbors. So we need to, first of all, uh, figure out what ranks are our neighbors. So since we're dealing with a periodic boundary condition, we need to say that like if if I'm rank zero, my my left hand neighbor is actually the the largest rank, and for my right hand neighbor, if I am the largest rank, my right hand neighbor is actually rank zero. So we we kind of just deal with the periodic boundary conditions by determining which our neighbors are, and then. 
because the MPI send and MPI receive procedures are um, kind of uh, two sided, and the two in, the two ranks that are involved in the communication have to agree and have a matching send and receive. We actually have to adjust how we're going to code this a little bit, right? If everybody calls MPI send to send a, a value to their, uh, in this example, right neighbor, well, nobody is available to do the corresponding MPI receive call and start receiving data. So we have to try and make sure that at least one process doesn't call MPI send and goes ahead and calls MPI receive so that we can get this chain of events where uh, we don't end up in a deadlock where everybody's waiting for everybody else. <laughs> um, but then once the, the process that skipped the send has finished its receive, it does need to call send because there's somebody waiting on it to, to, to call the receive. Uh, and then ditto for the opposite direction. So we're, we're going to communicate, uh, we're going to communicate data to our right neighbor and then to our left neighbor. And we just have to sequence those uh, so that somebody starts calling receive and then calls send so that we get uh, a balanced MPI send and receive. And then once we've done all that communication, then we can go ahead and do the calculation of the derivatives because now we've gotten in, we've gotten uh, the data that we need. Ah, yeah. Dan's uh, looking ahead on me. Uh, I, I I will here in a second show the example where we where we uh, we do we use the non-blocking send and receives. Um, but yeah, so so once we've gotten the data from our neighbors, then we can calculate the the derivatives on our endpoints and use the regular do loop to calculate the derivatives on the inner on the inner points. And then for the second derivative, we've basically got the exact same communication strategy where we need data from our left and right neighbors um, in order to do the calculation. So, uh, but then once we've finished that whole song and dance about coordinating all the communications, then we can go ahead and do the derivative calculations. And so as we step through time, um, the the top level algorithm looks basically identical identical with the difference that now no one no one process has the whole answer um, the field is distributed across all the processes so each process needs to show its portion of the solution field and we're gonna we're gonna mark you know which which process is this so that we can kind of see uh, see what the what the solution looks like so let's change directories over to the burger solver uh, again we don't need anything special for uh, for the compilation and we should be able to just do an MPI or an S run of the MPI version and now you can see we've got uh, ranks zero through seven and you would uh, have to manually kind of you could either manually orchestrate to have it coordinated such that they print them in order otherwise you kind of have to go look in and see you know we start at near zero so rank zero is going to be the left hand side of the domain so we start at a near zero it starts to increase you know as you start to get towards ranks two and three you start to see the peak and then it starts to decrease again and then as you get through ranks four you should start to you should end up near zero again go negative five has the peak on negative then we start to come back up to rank seven which near the end of rank seven you should see start to head back towards zero so we, we look, it looks like we're, you know, slowly damping that sinusoidal wave uh, via uh, diffusion, right? So 
we're still getting the right answer, but we're doing it. We're doing the calculations in a distributed manner and only doing the communications of the limited points that we need uh, in order to step through time and, and do the solution uh, with the derivative calculations. So that's kind of the, the basic high level of how we're doing the calculations and then how we can do the distributed version of that calculation using MPI. As Dan already mentioned in the chat, a uh, better practice way to avoid this deadlock situation is use non-blocking sends and receives. Uh, so there are there are there's an MPI I send and an MPI I receive, and those are non-blocking versions. Uh, but they add one they add an additional argument, which is this MPI request type thing. And what that says is I'm going to call MPI receive saying I expect to receive some data from my left neighbor. Um, but keep track of when this is going to be done using this MPI request type variable and then let and then go ahead and return. That way I can progress, I can go ahead and make progress in, in the code and I'll come back to it later to see if it's done. And so what we can end up doing is have a couple of receive calls set up and say, hey, I'm going to expect to receive some data. Uh, and then, oh, I but I also need to send some data to my neighbors. So I need data for my neighbors and I want to send some data to my neighbors, but neither of these uh, these calls are blocking. I'm just going to have an extra variable that's going to keep track of whether or not these communications have completed. Now, in terms of now being able to overlap the computations with the communications, I can go ahead and go through that loop of the inner points because I don't need the data that we're communicating in order to do the computations for the inner points in my, in my portion of the field. But once I do, once I've completed all those, I do need to make sure that I've gotten the data from my neighbors in order to do the computations on the endpoints. So MPI wait is the procedure that you call to say, hey, that, that communication that I initiated earlier, wait here until that's done. And so once this once this call returns, it's saying, hey, the the communication that you initiated and stored a reference to in this variable is now done. You can assume that the data is where you wanted it to be. And so then we can go ahead and do that next calculation and then we'll go ahead and wait on the other one and then we can do the other calculation. Um, this will again allow in some situations, some amount of overlap of the communication and computation, um, assuming that this one actually does complete before this one, and that, or that um, this hadn't finished, this hadn't completed before we had finished uh, the calculation across the inner points. And then before we leave, anytime you call a non blocking. Uh, send or receive operation or really any non blocking uh, communication or coordination operation, you need to make sure that that operation has completed before any data that it's going to reference goes out of scope. So we may not need the data that we sent to our neighbors anymore. But if that data has not actually started to be sent to our neighbors and we leave this procedure, that data now disappears as far as the MPI communication is concerned. It can't reference it anymore because it's gone out of scope. So while you trade the ability to, you know, kind of avoid those deadlocks and now the ability to overlap communications and uh, computations, you now have to manually keep track of making sure that things that are referencing data that might be local really have completed before that data goes away. So there's, there's a, there's some trade off there in terms of uh, what is your, 
what operations do you want to use when you're when you're using MPI to kind of make sure that things are working correctly? Um, so, uh, and ditto for these receive calls. Um, you're unlikely to really forget those. Let's see. In this example, we compute the local endpoints separately. Actually, in all of the examples, uh, the 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 endpoints are calculated separately because uh, we're doing we're since we're using the uh, periodic boundary condition, there those have to be treated a little bit specially, right? So even in the serial version, um, you'll look we we did uh, call those out specially because you know for 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 i equal one, we'd be grabbing an element that doesn't exist on the left hand side. And for i equals the number of points, we'd be grabbing uh, a, a, an element that doesn't exist on the right hand side, right? So we'd be going out of bounds if we didn't manually handle the endpoints. And so the same thing is true for both of the MPI examples as well that yeah, we handle the endpoints specially because we, we need to do some communication to get the values that are off the end. Um, and so with the MPI receive calls, you're less likely to kind of forget to do a wait, but you also have to make sure that you've done a wait before you access the, the data that's in that buffer you told it to Put the values into so you're saying hey I, I need a value from my left neighbor when when it comes in put it in this variable um, there's nothing the compiler's not going to warn you runtime's probably not even going to notice if you access that variable before an mpi wait that's actually that's actually invalid sometimes the data might have gotten there but sometimes it might not uh, the MPI wait is how you make sure that, hey, the data did get into that variable I asked MPI to put it in, um, and then, then you can go ahead and access it. And, and then, like I said, with the, with the send uh, wait is how you make sure that, hey, MPI is done with that variable before you uh, either overwrite the data that's in it or go out of scope and now that variable doesn't exist anymore. So let's go ahead and, oh, and the, the second derivative is now, again, the identical communication pattern. We can calculate the derivative on the inner points while we wait on the communications to happen, and then do the weights and do the calculations for the endpoints and wait on the sends to have completed. All right, so again, we can just compile without any special flags with the Cray compiler and do an S run of the async example. And we should be getting the same answer, right? So on rank seven, we are negative, but headed back towards zero. On rank zero, we start at near zero and start to increase. Um, rank three looks like it's got the peak values and starts to head back down. Rank six looks like it, uh, rank, rank five maybe, looks like it's got the peak negative value and it started to head back up. All right, so our, our shape looks like it's correct. And again, we've got the distributed computation that we were able to accomplish. So any questions regarding the MPI examples, uh, specifically the Berger's equation? Does blocking refer to the data being buffered? Uh, blocking says that the, the call to that procedure will not return until the operation is completed. Uh, Non-blocking says that the call to that procedure will return even if the communication operation has not completed. So that, that we're blocking the progress of execution or not. The associates 
construct seems to be a good way to reduce the complexity of the code, like those with MPIs, but I've never used it in my code. Can you comment on the situations that are good for using the associate construct? I generally use the associate construct for intermediate values that I don't really want to have to declare uh, variables for that have a limited scope. So in this example, right, the, the values I need for left and right neighbor here, um, I don't need to declare a, a local variable for that. And I only really need it in the context of these MPI communication calls. So this kind of gives me a local scope where I didn't have to declare a variable, but I can get the answer to a calculation that I'm going to do and then use it with an added bonus that if I try and redefine this value, the compiler will yell at me. Right? So, whereas if I had declared a local variable, but I only really wanted to do a calculation and store a value in that variable once, if I inadvertently change its value somewhere in, in this procedure, when I didn't mean to, the compiler would just go, oh, well, you recalculated the value in that variable. That's what you meant, right? Um, but th this is kind of a way of saying, like, here's a calculation I want to do. I want to give a name to that to the result, and then I want to use that value in more than one place in a local scoped context. Uh, I find it really useful in terms of structuring code and kind of expressing intent in that way. You can also use associate to give short names to variables, but I tend not to do that nearly as often. And if you do it that way, so, so if you say, uh, for example, let's say associate X arrow position, where position is a variable, you can then say X equals zero, right? To, to reset um, position. There's a couple of additional caveats when you do something like that. And like I said, I tend to not use that as a pattern because I like more functional, immutable uh, style. But uh, it, that is another possibility. Okay. Associate. Answered that. Um, we answered that. Blocking refers to blocking progress of execution. Okay, and I'll come back to that one. That explanation is probably a bit more long-winded. Okay. Well, there's a chat message. Huh? Uh, in this example, we compute the local endpoints separately. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I answered that one a little bit ago, and yeah, we always have to calculate the endpoints separately because uh, the the indexing scheme would run off the ends of the bounds of the array. We're we're doing a a, a periodic boundary condition, so for the endpoints we have to do something special anyway. Um, and when we're doing distributed communications, that something special just involves communicating with our neighbors. Hopefully that answers that question. Thanks. Okay, should we go ahead and move on to the co-arrays example then? All right, so for co-arrays, what are we gonna do differently? So I take a slightly different approach to this when it comes to co-arrays. I'm actually gonna declare my intermediate variables here in the time stepping algorithm so the the field the field variables as co-arrays now um, since they were allocatable arrays before i'm going to leave them as allocatable and if they are allocatable co-arrays 
you can specify a colon to say, hey, I'm going to define how how many images or what, what the co-bounds, so just like arrays have bounds, co-arrays have co-bounds, I'm going to define what the co-bounds are later because this is allocatable. The, um, then for the initialization, uh, we'll start to deal with the fact that this is a co-array. Right? So now this argument we're going to say is a co-array and it's allocatable and intent out, right? So this is where we're gonna allocate that, that field. Um, again, we're gonna say, uh, we're gonna require that the number of points we're doing is ev evenly divisible by the number of images, just to help us make the, the uh, decomposition, the domain decomposition a little bit easier and do the same thing where we're going to distribute that field across the number of images. So the number of points that this image needs is going to be divided by however many, ima uh, however many images there are. And then we can go ahead and allocate that field. And so this is where the um, co-arrays is termed a PGAS language partitioned global address space. So this is saying um, the local size of this array, um, so I'm partitioning the array, but it's got a global address space, meaning that all of the images can access this array. Um, th this is where that partitioned global address space name comes in. That's what co-arrays are. There's, they're a, partitioned uh, space that is accessible globally. So we're going to go ahead and allocate that field. Um, then we're going to use the same uh, adjustment that we did for the MPI examples to, to say what are the x-coordinates of this point on the field. And we'll just initialize our portion of the global field. And then we have, I've, I've got a, a kind of helper subroutine here that I call to synchronize. And because of the way the data dependencies work, an image really only needs to synchronize with its neighbors. Like we don't need a global synchronization. I just need to make sure that the, my neighbors are done with my data and I'm done with my neighbor's data before we continue on with uh, the next step in the calculation. So for the initialization, I, would, I just need to make sure that my neighbors have initialized their portion of the field before I can continue. And ditto, my neighbors need to make sure that I've initialized my part of the field before they can continue. So that little helper routine is where I'm gonna use sync images. And this is where I explained that you have to make sure that these are um, coherent between images. So if I'm going to say that my neighbor, that I'm waiting on my neighbor, my neighbor needs to say that I'm waiting on me. And in the special, the special case that we've got two images, um, my, left, my left neighbor and my right neighbor are the same. And the standard says you're not allowed to specify an image more than once in this list. So in the special case that there are two images, I only have one neighbor. But other, otherwise, left and right neighbor. Um, if we're running with only one image, then we don't need any synchronization because we're all, we've only got one image anyway. So that, that's the logic for doing the synchronization. So. Once we've uh, initialized our global field and synchronized, um, everybody's gonna also allocate the same amount of space for the, the intermediate variables that we need in, in the calculation. And then we can go start doing our time stepping. Now, the time stepping now has to be adjusted slightly to deal with the synchronization that we're going to do 
So I've, I've again written a little helper function that says do the assignment and synchronize um, to give us a spot to put that synchronization that needs to happen. We can still do the right hand side expression without any synchronization. But we need to make sure that our neighbors are done with our data and vice versa before we can uh, continue on in the calculation. So if we go look at that little helper function, basically it's going to say, do the assignment to the left hand side and then call synchronize. So we're, so we're always going to, so we can do the assignment to here and then we'll do a synchronization to make sure we've all done that assignment and that that data is ready before we start doing this calculation, which involves those values. But again, it is also a looser form of synchronization. It's just that my neighbors know that my data is ready so they can start looking at it. Um, so we've done the initialization. We're ready to start doing time stepping. Um, so what does the derivative calculation start to look like? Um, I need to know who I am and uh, how big my portion of the field is. And I need to know my left neighbor, um, which again, if I'm image one, then my left neighbor is actually num images and uh, for right neighbor, if I'm image num images, then my right neighbor is actually image one. So we have to account for that periodic boundary condition in the neighbor calculation. And then accessing my neighbor's part of the global field is just a matter of using a square bracket and saying, hey, I need, I need the right point of my neighbor, my left neighbors global field in order to do the derivative calculation on my left boundary and ditto on the right hand side i need the the left point on my right neighbors global field in order to do the derivative calculation on my right boundary so we've we've traded off any of the uh trickier MPI explicit like communication, two-sided communication calls. And so there's no synchronization that has to happen in the derivative calculations. Uh, ditto for the, uh, the second derivative calculation. All right, we just need to know what our neighbor is, and which one is our neighbor, and then we can just go grab the data from our neighbor. We don't have to wait for them to send it to us. But at the cost of we do have to do some synchronization as we go through the time stepping to make sure that as we're, uh, as we're doing the calculations, we have to make sure that our neighbor has completed the calculation for the data that I'm about to go look at. So there's, there's a bit of a trade-off there in terms of where does the additional complexity start to come in. So Again, with co-arrays with the Cray compiler, we don't need any special compiler flags. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to ask my salloc command for nine processes so that I can run eight processes with the co-arrays. Although it says partition in down state. I don't know what that means. Does that mean it's going to... Hmm. I wonder if that means it's going to take a long time. Yeah, there's a big reservation on today, but we have our own reservation. Yeah. So that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we I have just, our own reservation, and the 
reservation is for the GP. Oh, it's the, not yeah, but I. Known, so I don't, I don't know. Yeah, so system is in a downstate. I saw a message. So some some network issue. So can I get? If you check MOTD, you'll see that. Eight. Cores. So maybe they set all the uh, petitions down while investigating. Well, that would be. Try it. Can you run it on logging out? <laughs> Just in for any. I know uh, you cannot run MPI. No, I can't, I can't run MPI or co no. Right. I'm not sure that you can open MP, so that's what I'm asking. <laughs> um, right, just, you can check S info and you'll see all the nodes of you know a download. S info. I think it probably marked all the petitions down. Um are they all down? Yeah. System is down. Well, oh, that... opening jobs. Can I open a MOTD link? You can see that. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate. And not do hands on or demo then. <clears throat> but if I if I had not relinquished my interactive session, I could have kept going. That's unfortunate. Yeah, that's possible. I can't say for sure. What happens if I run? Yeah, it will run, but it just one image. Yeah. Which is not particularly interesting because it does pretty much the exact same thing <laughs> that the serial version does that way. Yeah, this one down started at 940, but probably like you said, if you are in a session, you're grabbing the node. No, that was when, when partitions marked down, no jobs can be submitted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then. Well, let's at least take questions. Let's see. Coarray is non-blocking. Yeah, all Coarray accesses are, well, Actually, let me put it this way. Coal array gets are blocking. So, so if the if the coal array if you get square brackets on the left hand side of an assignment statement, that's called a put. I'm going to send data to another image. That is non-blocking. Like this image is going to say, "Hey, I need to send that data over there," and it can continue on. Gets are blocking because that's going to appear in an expression. And it's, I need to have the value before I can continue evaluating the expression. But the compiler is allowed to have initiated the data transfer, like, hey, I need data from over there. The compiler is allowed to move where the access is started, at least as far as a uh, an image control statement. So it says, you can look ahead and say, hey, I see you're going to need a value from that image over there. I'll start going to get it so that by the time we get to the portion of evaluating that expression, you've already got the value. So, um, yeah, so for in, in general, you don't need to worry about the blocking versus non-blocking aspect of co-arrays. It's just not a, not a thing that you have to think about. Why would you use pointwise sync image, images for synchronization instead of using events? Um, probably you might use events. Uh, pro so you could do a lot more complex communication and coordination mechanism for this example, but I didn't want to go quite as advanced as using events in this training as more of a beginner level. Um, but yeah, you. You could use something like events where you have a, a buffer for an image and when an image is done calculating its portion of the field sends sends its endpoints to the neighbors that are going to need it completely asynchronously because they've got a co array they've declared like hey when you're ready put those there and then that image can 
uh, look at the event that the sending image is going to, you know, it's going to send that data and then send a, a message, hey, I sent this data, it's ready. The, the, other, the, the other images can then wait on the event where the image is said that it's sent the data. Um, so yeah, the, the, the algorithm gets more complicated. Uh, and as of 2023, we have a put with notify, so you can actually kind of do this as a, as a single statement for the send data over to that image. Um, and then the, yeah, the synchronization becomes even less coupled. Um, the coordination is almost entirely asynchronous other than the fact that to some degree, the images kind of have to be uh, in a similar stage of the calculation like you can't really get far ahead in the uh in the time stepping calculation but uh there's a lot less coordination that has to happen how would you handle the case where num images does not evenly divide num points uh yeah so for for a not evenly divided number of images what you're going to do is you're going to have some images have an extra point compared to their neighbors um, and so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be quite as more much more complicated. Um, the calculation where we determine uh, so we know how many number number of points that we've asked for because that's uh, one of our kind of parameters. So we know how many points we've asked for globally. Um, when you're calculating the number of points locally. Um, this calculation becomes slightly more complicated and then exactly where we shift um, for my portion of the local grid, what are the X coordinates of that, um, that becomes slightly more complicated. Uh, Dan, yeah, go ahead. So you skipped over the line that was the crux of my question, which is the allocate statement. The allocate, okay. Does not, doesn't that require the array to be the same size on every image? Indeed, it does. So you would have to adjust that. Um, so some image, so you have to make sure that everybody allocates that the same size. Uh, and then so everybody's going to have to allocate it to the biggest size that everybody needs. And then some images are just probably not going to use the last point, right? Yeah, that is that is an extra complication. You wouldn't necessarily have to do that for MPI, right? Because MPI is not using a, a global address space where everybody has to agree on the sizes. But that is a good point. Thank you. Yeah, so you're going to have a slight complication on calculation of number of points, slight complication on what is the allocate statement, and how are we uh, initializing our grid. And then when you're looking at accessing those grids, you'll have some slight complications to, to deal with that as well. Good question. Let's see. Looked like Rawl uh, was starting to type a question. Did you still have that question or did you want to just unmute and ask it? Yeah, my question was already answered. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Let's see. Is there anything else that I wanted to try and cover? I think I think that about covered all the examples. So oh, I would no, yeah. Okay. So we'll jump back over to the, so we just handled some of the questions. Now I was going to, <laughs> I was going to have us kind of do a, a little, you know, friendly competition in terms of use the techniques that you've learned over the last couple of days to try and see how fast you can make the burger solver or the Mandelbrot area solver run. Uh, with a couple of, you know, constraints given, you know, for the burger solver, 
do the time stepping out to a second with a thousand nodes and no more than eight processes you see how fast you can get that to run uh, for the Mandelbrot area uh, the same number of points as it already specified but no more than eight processes just see how fast you can get that to run um, because one of the things about the the parallel programming techniques that we learned about over the last two days is you can actually mix and match from the two days you it is entirely valid to have use OpenMP to spawn threads and do uh, shared memory calculations in parallel while at the same time using either coarrays or MPI to do distributed memory calculations. And so this, this was going to be kind of the opportunity to, to practice uh, seeing how you could mix and match those. Um, and ditto with do concurrent. You could have do concurrent and you can mix do concurrent and co-arrays and the do concurrent is going to do shared memory parallelism and the co-arrays are going to do distributed memory parallelism and you can do the domain decomposition and the parallel calculations at two levels of parallelism. So I was going to have, I was going to give everybody time to go play with those couple of examples and try and mix and match them. The, the different parallel programming models and see who could get, you know, get one of those to run the fastest is just kind of a friendly competition. But with uh, Perlmutter being down, uh, that might be a little tricky. <laughs> so I might give it one last shot <laughs> if yeah, it's still down. So yeah, it's still down. How about people doing, um, offline and then report their numbers in the Google Doc or something. Yeah, I will. I'll tell you all what I will. So that that spreadsheet is public. Uh, the link to it is in the slides. So for the next week, I'll check on it next week. Uh, and I don't really have anything I can offer to the winner, but I will reach out to anybody who's uh, who, who has uh, attempted it. We'll see what some of the, uh, the fastest times are. And I will ask anybody who is in, in the leaderboard towards the top, uh, towards the top of the fastest solutions to maybe come uh, explain how, how did you achieve that, uh, that faster, faster speeds. Uh, will we still have access to the training account? Unfortunately, no, and it won't even let me adjust it. <laughs> I was, I, I was hoping to try and expand that so that we could still have access to the training account, but I don't believe that will be available after today either. So, so yeah, so <clears throat> training account created for the reservation. So if someone needs a training account, um, we can just reach out to me directly, Helen. He, um, I'll work out that for you. Yeah, we. we, well, we don't know. Yeah, we can work out getting an extra <laughs> account set up and, and give you access. So if you if you want that, reach out, uh, reach out to Helen specifically, or I'll just forward it along to her and we'll we'll coordinate that. Um, so what or another thing I can do is if you've got access to other systems, uh, we'll add the caveat as you know what system did you run that on to get it that fast, uh, um, just to kind of you know, if you wanted to run it on your local laptop, feel free, go ahead, see how fast you can get it to go. Um, unfortunately, we just can't help uh, get your environment set up for any other systems than Perlmutter. Um, yep, reminder, please, uh, as soon as we're done, please go take that post-training survey. We really appreciate feedback. Uh, hopefully we can uh, keep putting on these uh, training sessions and hopefully we can make them useful as possible. But unfortunately with Perlmutter being down, uh, that is all that I had for today. So thank you all for joining me. Uh, I hope you all learned something. 
uh, please, yeah, hopefully Perlmutter comes back up at some point today and you can go give uh, a couple of these examples a try and see what you can come up with. Uh, feel free to go post your results in the leaderboard there. Um, and, you know, feel free to reach out if you have more questions about any of the topics that we covered today. I will, uh, I'll probably uh, monitor that Q&A for the rest of the day, uh, but uh, feel free to add so you can ask questions there, uh, but feel free to reach out to me directly if you've got more questions about things we covered today, and hopefully, hopefully we can answer them and help you start making better use of Perlmutter and, you know, doing some parallel programming. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, that's the end of it for today.